This blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on that judgment tree.
crowns my life with loving kindness is triumph song I'll ever sing. To honor the weight of your glory, there are no words we could speak to capture the depth of your beauty. Jesus, there's no one like you. Jesus, we love you. Ever adore you. There's no Jesus, we love you, ever adore you, Lord. We adore you. There is no sinner beyond the infinite stretch of your mercy. How can we? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to our Sunday meeting today. Uh, if you are new here, uh, may I give you a good warm welcome. My name is Matthew Laws. I'm a member of staff here. It's my pleasure to be leading our time together today. Uh, well done for braving the weather and the rain. I got very wet feet on my walk down here. I hope um, if you are wet, you're able to dry off uh, uh, during the service. Um, if you're new, please do stay on at the end. We'll be having coffee afterwards. We'd love to get to know you, so please do stay on for that. If you're new and watching online, do join us for Zoom coffee. That's a great chance to meet a few people on there and, uh, and get to know them too. There are a number of reasons why today is a special day for us. Uh, first, we'll be celebrating communion again today across all of our services. For many of us, this will be the first time since the pandemic uh, began that we'll have shared in the Lord's Supper. So it's an important day for us. It'll be a little bit different as we need to keep things COVID safe, but it'll be good for us nevertheless, and we'll explain more about how we'll be doing that later on in the service. Just as a warning now for those who are on the live stream, uh, we're going to be ending the service for you um, uh, and you're joining in with us uh, before we share communion, as communion is a in-person, physical thing for us to do together. We'll let you know uh, when that's happening and we'll say goodbye to you at that point. Today's also an interesting day, isn't it? Because it's Halloween. 
you can't help but notice our society around us joining in with all of these celebrations. Though we don't want to be too much of a party pooper, as Christians, we believe that we've got better things to celebrate, don't we? Um, so this afternoon, the children are having a light party. That would be a great fun thing. If, you're, if you've got children and want to bring them along, do join in with that. And in the Church of England calendar as well today, uh, instead, we're encouraged to celebrate either All Saints Day or Reformation Day. The former is a time to remember all faithful Christians who've gone before us and are now in heaven with God, and the latter to focus specifically on those like Martin Luther, who brought about a return to the true gospel in the church. So with those things in mind, we're going to begin with a time of prayer, a prayer of thanksgiving set for today, picking up on themes of light and darkness and following the saints who have gone before us. Let me lead us in prayer. Blessed are you, sovereign God, ruler and judge of all. To you be praise and glory forever. In the darkness of this age that is passing away, may the light of your presence, which the saints enjoy, surround our steps as we journey on. May we reflect your glory this day and so be made ready to see your face in the heavenly city where night shall be no more. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Amen. We'll sing now. Eve, Bex, and Johnny are leading us. So let's stand to praise God for His faithfulness.
that rain? Oh, I'm sure I'll be all right. Oh, oh no. Oh, Dan, why did you go out without an umbrella? Look, here, have my coat. Come on. Oh. Yeah, put this oh. on. Put this on, you silly man. Oh, thanks, guys. Oh. we saw the trainees look out for Dan in each situation, today in the book of Numbers we'll see that God looks out for and protects his people in every situation. Well, our God is faithful and he is our saviour 
Whatever attacks we face, he is with us. And that means he is willing to forgive us again and again. We do go against him, but he is always for us. So we can come now with confidence of his love in confession for our sin. Thinking now of those times when we've not been faithful to him, we'll say these words together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. And knowing the assurance of forgiveness, we can continue in prayer. And Paul is going to lead us. As Matt has reminded us, today, amongst other things, is Reformation Day. Last Sunday was Bible Sunday. So those two things and much else gives us many reasons to thank God and plenty to pray for. So let's pray together. We praise you, the Lord who speaks, and at whose word creation dawned, God said. We praise you, the Lord who speaks, and at whose word salvation dawned, the word became flesh. At your command, light came out of darkness, and life out of nothingness. And in Christ, you go on giving light to the spiritually blind and bringing dead people to life through the Spirit. For God, who said, let sh light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for feeding us with your word. We're grateful for those who teach us from the scriptures and for those who teach our children and young people. In this country, we have a rich legacy and we remember today those who paid a high price so that the Bible could be freely available in English. Well-known names like John Wycliffe, William Tyndale and Thomas Cranmer, but many other unsung heroes beside them men and women. The word of God is not chained, as some of them were, and we praise you for its unstoppable spread around the globe. We give thanks today for the work of Acorn Bible Training in Hungary and for our mission partners there, Andy and Jofi Oatridge. We praise you for a good start to this year's training course and we pray both for the students in their next session this coming Saturday and for the training team as they work hard to deliver and improve the course. Thank you too for the encouragement of their church's youth weekend away and the many young people who invited friends to join in. Please may these teenagers want to know more about the Lord Jesus and become regulars in that group. And please help Jofi as she reads the Bible with another mum from school who turned to Christ this last summer. Nearer to home, we pray for the ministry of Tom Brown and the church family at Kirk Sandal and Edenthorpe on the other side of Doncaster. Thank you that Tom, Claire, and their two young daughters were able to move there from Kilnhurst this summer and for the early encouragement of people responding to the teaching of scripture, prayer meetings starting up, and evangelistic activities coming onto the agenda. Please, Lord, in a really wearing and challenging season, may they stay faithful, and may the Spirit move hearts among the thousands of people they'll have contact with 
over the Remembrance Day and Christmas events coming up soon. Within our own church family, we want to rejoice with those who've seen recent encouragements and joys, but also to weep with those dealing with sorrow and great difficulties. Ian Harris faces a major, serious operation tomorrow. We pray for a successful outcome and that he, Jenny, and their son, Nick, may know your strengthening presence and stand firm in the faith. There are other brothers and sisters among us with serious illness and operations. We ask this for them as well. And finally for us all, as Pete preaches to us from Numbers, as we open our Bibles on our own or with other believers through the coming week, and as we meet with our bishops tomorrow and on Tuesday, we close with a collect or special prayer for Bible Sunday. Bless Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Paul, very much. Just a few pieces of uh, church family news. I say a few, actually, it's a slightly bumper edition today, Church Family News. The very best thing you could do, uh, if you're interested in Church Family News, is to download the service sheet and print it off and give it a good read, because there's lots on there today. Um, there's loads of things that you need to have a look at. You can go onto the, uh, onto the website, onto the, uh, the page for today's service, and there's the, the sheet there. Uh, give it a look, because there's, there's lots of details about all sorts of things. There's a kids, kids' events, the light party this afternoon, the fireworks party, the big day out... There's things, uh, a couple of day conferences next Saturday for students and for women. There's special prayer meetings for mission partners. There's job adverts. Look, there's so much on there. Please remember to have a look at the service sheet um, on the website. This week as well, there's um, some important meetings for us all as a church family. On Monday and Tuesday, we have uh, meetings with our bishops to talk about the bishops' visitation and, and to, um, for them to take questions. Do come and join in with those if you can. And then on Wednesday, it's our church family prayer meeting on Zoom. Another really important time for our whole church family to gather and pray to God. May I remind us as well about our Vision Sunday a few weeks ago. We had Vision Sunday. We had um, um, a wonderful sermon from Pete presenting uh, the, the vision for seeing God's glory in our own weakness, trusting in his power, but as well then hearing about the giving needs, uh, the financial needs for church. Um, and we're inviting and encouraging everyone to sort of go onto the website and to uh, review your giving and to just let the PCC know whether, what you'll be doing, whether your giving will be sort of staying at the same level or increasing or decreasing so that the PCC can set their budget. If you could do that in the next week, uh, that'd be really helpful for those who've not yet done it. That would, um, that would help a lot. Please, uh, please do that. Finally, a, um, a, a sad to say, uh, many of you will know Peter Lee he was a member of our church family for 50 years or so. Uh, Peter died on Friday night. Um, uh, no details yet about funeral and that sort of thing. Um, but do please pray for his wife, Jill, and for his four children. He was a good Christian man, member, long-standing member of our church family. So I'm sure it'll be uh, sad news for many. But we know that he is with the Lord now, don't we? So let's pray for, for the family. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the life of Peter. Thank you that he was your child, loved by you. Thank you that he was a member here of this church family, loved by many of us. And Lord, uh, it's sad that he is taken from us, but we are glad that he is with you now. Lord, we pray for his wife Jill and his children and his extended family. Please draw near to them in their grief. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come to our reading now, which is in uh, two parts, and Andrea will be bringing that for us.
Our reading this morning is taken from Numbers chapter 22, reading verses 1 through to 35, and then continuing Numbers 24, verses 1 to 19. Then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan opposite Jericho. Now Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, the horde is going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to summon Balak, son of Beor, who was at Pithor near the river Euphrates in his native land. Balak said, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they're too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the fee for divination. When they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Spend the night here, Balaam said to them, and I will report back to you with the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabite officials stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. A people that has come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I will be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. The next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak's officials, go back to your own country for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the Moabite officials returned to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak sent other officials more numerous and more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and said, this is what Balak, son of Zippor says, do not let anything keep you from coming to me because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. But Balaam answered them, even if I, Balak, give me all the silver and gold in his palace, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord, my God. Now spend the night here so that I can find out what else the Lord will tell me. That night, God came to Balaam and said, since these men have come to summon you, go with them, do, but do only what I tell you. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the Moabite officials. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat it to get it back on the road. Then the angel came... Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down on the Balaam and he was angry and beat it with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and it said to Balaam, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I will kill you here and now. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your own donkey which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked him, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. 
The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have spared it. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now, if you are displeased, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with Balak's officials. Continuing now from Numbers 24 through from verses 1 to 19. Now when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not resort to divination as at other times, but turned his face towards the wilderness. When Balaam looked out and saw Israel encamped tribe by tribe, the Spirit of God came to him and he spoke his message. The prophecy of Balaam, son of Beor, the prophecy of one whose eye sees clearly, the prophecy of one who hears the words of God, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who falls prostrate and whose eyes are opened. How beautiful are your tents, Jacob, your dwelling places, Israel. Like valleys they spread out, like gardens beside a river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from their buckets, their seed will have abundant water. Their king will be greater than Agag, their kingdom will be exalted. God brought them out of Egypt, they have the strength of a wild ox. They devour hostile nations and break their bones in pieces. With their arrows, they pierce them. Like a lion, they crouch and lie down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse them? May those who bless you be blessed, and those who curse you be cursed. Then Balak's anger burned against Balaam. He struck his hands together and said to him, I summoned you to curse my enemies, but you have blessed them these three times. Now leave at once and go home. I said I would reward you handsomely, but the Lord has kept you from being rewarded. Balaam answered Balak, did I not tell the messengers you sent me? Even if Balak gave me all the silver and gold in his palace, I could not do anything of my own accord, good or bad, to go beyond the command of the Lord. And I must say only what the Lord says. Now I am going back to my people, but come, let me warn you of what this people will do to your people in days to come. Then he spoke his message. The prophecy of Balaam, son of Beor, the prophecy of one whose eye sees clearly, the prophecy of one who hears the words of God, who has knowledge from the Most High, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who falls prostrate and whose eyes are open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the forbs of Moab, the skulls of all the people of Sheth. Edom will be conquered. Seir, his enemy, will be conquered, but Israel will grow strong. A ruler will come out of Jacob and destroy the survivors of the city. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Angie, for reading. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. I should say, I've had a slight cold this week. If I sound croaky this morning, I do apologize. I have um, had several COVID tests. They're all negative, just in case you're worried. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this ancient story, uh, which is packed full of the wonder of your power and protection for your people. And I pray this morning, as we look at it together, that you would help us to be of great courage, not in our strength, but in your faithful, promise-keeping power. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We long to be safe, whether we're a child scared of monsters under the bed, or a first-year student at university away from home for the first time, or waiting for the phone call to come back from the doctor with the results. We long to be safe, and it's hard, isn't it? Because this world is not a safe place. Yes, some of our fears are misplaced. There are no monsters under the bed. But many fears are well-founded. Many students do struggle at university. The results often do come back, and they aren't good news. I've found myself going back to check if the car 
really is locked because I've started to forget to lock it. When I go away on holiday, I've started to worry about what's happening at our house because people do break in when you're away on holiday. We worry about job security and mortgage repayments because people do lose their jobs and forfeit on their mortgages. Today up in Glasgow, the latest UN climate change conference kicks off. And it's right to be worried about global warming and the future of our planet. We long to be safe, but the thing is, this world is not a safe world. Where can we find true safety? Well, that's a question that takes us right to the heart of our reading from Numbers this morning. Since Numbers 11, we've been watching the people on a journey through the desert to the promised land of the new creation, and we've seen a whole series of crises that have befallen the people, not from external threats, but from within the camp, the people's sin and rebellion against the Lord. But this week, the threat does come from outside. There's something of the, the pantomime in these chapters. A, a talking donkey, the, um, the will he, won't he of, of Balaam and his cursing. But beneath the comedy, beneath the surface, lies a deadly serious question. Can the Lord really keep his people safe? And the answer we'll see this morning gives us great encouragement for our journey home through this dangerous world until we reach the new creation. So let's dive in. Here's our first point. A serious threat. A serious threat. We pick up the story in Numbers 22, in verse 1. The people of God have made it to the Jordan River. They are right on the edge of the, new, uh, of the promised land. They're making great progress on their journey home. But the locals aren't happy. And so look at verse 3. And Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. And so Balak, king of Moab, he's worried about Israel eating all his food for the people of Moab. And so he hatches a plan. He sends for help. He knows, he knows of just the man to turn to. The man is Balaam. Balaam is not a local. In fact, he's from Pethor, which is in northern Syria, a completely different country from Moab, some distance away, which means that Balaam has an international reputation for being able to bless and curse. Look at verse 6. Balak says, Now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I'll be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. Now our modern materialistic minds might scoff at this notion of a person being able to bless and curse. But we shouldn't. And not just because Balaam has built up an international reputation, which is clear here in Numbers, but also in extra biblical material as well. Now, the Bible is also very clear that the spiritual world is real. We see this in the New Testament with the great damage evil forces do to people. And we see it around the world today. And so we should be in no doubt that Balak's plan to enlist Balaam is a serious threat to God's people. And this kind of serious threat continues today. There is a hostile world that continues to threaten God's people, the church. And hostile evil forces continue to plan us harm. We should not be naive about the world we live in. Just as Israel would have been unaware of Balak's secret planning as they camped in the plains of Moab, so often we are unaware of the schemes that are being planned against the church by the world, by the evil one. But the threat is real for us. A threat that is too great for us to face on our own. 
So how does this pagan Balaam respond to Balak's request? Well, it's, it's complicated, isn't it? On, on one hand, Balaam seems to have some kind of direct access to the law of the God of Israel. And so in verse 9, uh, God comes to speak with him. And God is very clear, verse 12. Do not go with them. You must not put a curse on these people because they are blessed. And Balaam obeys God. Sorry, Balak, I cannot help you. No cursing from me today. But the story doesn't end there. Balak tries again. He gathers together a more important delegation with an even greater paycheck, perhaps danger money, to go against the Lord. And here is where we see the other side of Balaam. He should have just shut down this second conversation. But instead, he says to the delegation, verse 19, Now, spend the night here so that I can find out what else the Lord will tell me. Balaam is like a child asking for ice cream. The first answer is no. But he's trying again and again and again, seeing if the answer will change, because Balaam really wants the money. This is, confir- is confirmed in the New Testament, where Balaam is mentioned three times, always negatively. So, for example, in 2 Peter 2, we uh, read about how Balaam loved the wages of wickedness. Or in Jude, he's described, or the, his error is described as a desire for profit. You see, Balaam is more concerned about the money than he is about whether it is right to curse God's people. And it looks like Balaam's persistence has worked. Verse 20, that night God came to Balaam and said, since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. And if we press the pause button at this point, this is a very precarious moment for the people of Israel. Don't rush ahead too quickly in the story. Has God changed his mind? I mean, after all the rebellion in the desert, the grumbling against him, has he had enough with his people? Is he giving in to this pagan Balaam? Is he going to allow Balaam to curse God's people? This is a serious threat. Just as an aside, notice how both Balak and Balaam view the spiritual world. Balak wants to weaponize evil forces for his own ends. Balaam wants to manipulate God so that he can make lots of money. Both men think that they can use and wield these forces for their own ends. This same view is alive and well today. In a survey referenced recently on the BBC website, it seems that 51% of young people this year, aged 18 to 31, say that they pray at least once a month. 51%. Far more than the over 50s. It seems that rather than diminishing, the the sense of the spiritual world in this country is, is growing, particularly amongst our young people. Aware that this world isn't just the material, but also spiritual. But at the same time, many people think that they can manipulate some divine being in the spiritual world to get what they want in life. You got a driving test? Pray. You want to pass your exams? Pray. You want to get that job interview? Pray. Tests coming back from hospital? Pray. It sounds very spiritual, but it is spirituality on our terms to achieve our agenda. If there is a God, we're just asking him to be our servant, doing our bidding. A God to be wielded, not a God to be worshipped. But that is not the God we see revealed in Numbers, as Balaam and Balak are about to find out. A serious threat. Next, a silly mistake. A silly mistake. So Balaam heads off on his journey to Moab, 
<laughs> but it doesn't go well, does it? Verse 22. But God was angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Now, this doesn't seem to quite make sense, because just two verses earlier, the Lord said to Balaam to go with Balak's men. So why is he now angry with Balaam for, for going on this journey? Well, I think the answer is because of Balaam's motives. They're all wrong. He's going, hoping that it'll end in a curse on God's people and a lot of money for him. He thinks he's going to twist God's arm to allow him to curse Israel. But this is a silly mistake. What happens next does read like a pantomime. Balaam's donkey sees the angel of the Lord standing in the road ahead with a drawn sword. And quite rightly, the donkey veers off into a field to protect Balaam's life. Totally unaware, Balaam beats the donkey back on the road. The whole thing happens again. Next time, it's a narrow bit of road with walls. The, the donkey crushes Balaam's foot. And the third time, the donkey just lies down in the middle of the road. He won't go any further. And then the donkey speaks, verse 28, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? It's comical. We're meant to be laughing. But the comedy is making a devastating point. You see, animals hardly ever talk in the Bible. In fact, I can only think of one other time in the Bible when animals talk back in the garden, Genesis 3, when the serpent spoke. And just as in Shrek, donkeys back then were the butt of many jokes, seen as dumb, silly creatures. And the point here, and it is devastating for Balaam, is that Balaam, with this international reputation for being good at divination, a seer into the spiritual world who can control and manipulate the spiritual forces, cannot see what a dumb donkey can see as he lies in the dust on a road. And so there's real irony in Balaam's response to his donkey. Verse 29, you have made a fool of me. Well, yes, the donkey has made Balaam look foolish, but it's far worse than Balaam realizes. You see, he's not just sitting in the dust in the road because of the donkey. He's also totally spiritually blind to what's going on. And then verse 31, the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. And so he bowed low and fell face down. The God of the Bible cannot be controlled by anyone. He is not a God to be manipulated and coerced to follow our plans. He is not a God to be wielded, but a God to be worshipped. It's a real challenge for our culture today that wants the comfort of divine help, but on our terms. The one true God, the God of the Bible, does not exist to do our will. No, he is sovereignly at work in this world to bring about his will. And Balaam finally gets it, verse 34. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. You see, it's a silly mistake to think that we can use God, that we can oppose God. I think of Saul on the road to Damascus in the New Testament, on his way to persecute the church. No donkey involved, but Saul thrown from his horse. And in that moment, his eyes were opened to see the spiritual reality of the risen Lord Jesus, the one he was persecuting. And of course, in that moment, Saul, or the Apostle Paul's world, was changed forever. And today, the nations might rage like Balak does, or, or the devil prowls around looking for a meal to devour. But who do we fear? What do we fear in this world? Who can do us any real harm as God's people? This 
picture of Balaam sitting in the dust of the road, outdone by a donkey, is a picture of the futility, the silliness of opposing God. No power can prevail against him. God's people are safe. God's will for us, his promises for us, they will prevail. What is that will? That takes us to our final point. We've seen a serious threat, a silly mistake, finally a certain blessing. Well, Balaam does finally arrive in Moab. I wish we had more time to sort of linger over the details of what happens next. Just as Balaam was humbled by a donkey three times, so Balak gets humbled by Balaam three times. There's this whole thing about offering sacrifices. Balak um, does this elaborate sacrificial setup, hoping that Balaam will curse God's people three times. The cursing doesn't happen, only blessing. Balak is furious. And so he cries out, we're now in Numbers 24, in our second reading, Numbers 24, verse 10. Balak says, I summoned you to curse my enemies, but you have blessed them these three times. Now leave at once and go home. Balak's efforts have failed. The Lord's promise to bless his people has prevailed. And what the Lord says to his people through this pagan prophet from a distant land, after all the sin and rebellion of these 40 years wandering through the desert, what God says is truly stunning. In Balaam's first message, the Lord restates the promise he first made to Abraham to make Israel into a great nation like dust that cannot be counted. In the second message, the Lord restates his promise to bless Israel and protect her. And in the third message, which we had in our second reading, Numbers 24, God promises Israel a return to paradise. Look at Numbers 24, verse 6. Like valleys they spread out, like gardens beside a river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the water. Water will flow from their buckets. Their seed will have abundant water. Just imagine it. After 40 years of wandering through a dusty and hot desert, how glorious this promise must have sounded. Gardens, rivers, trees, water, abundance. It's paradise. It's a return to Eden before the fall. And then perhaps most famously of all, just look at the end of our reading from Numbers 24, verse 17. The Lord says through Balaam, a star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. Moses won't be able to lead God's people forever. We saw that last week. But here is a promise of a king who will rule Israel and what a king he will be. A king to crush every enemy. A king to make Israel strong forever. A certain blessing from the Lord through this pagan prophet, Balaam. In the coming years, the Lord did bring his people across the Jordan into the promised land. It was a good land, but it wasn't quite as good as this promise here in Numbers 24. The Lord did give his people kings, good kings, like David and Solomon, but, but kings not quite as good as the king here in Numbers 24. But over a thousand years after Balaam spoke these words, other wise men came from the east, magi, magicians, saw a star rise over Israel. They followed it and found the true king of the Jews, and they bowed down and worshipped him. You see, the great blessings of Numbers 23 and 24 have been fulfilled and secured for us in the coming of the Lord Jesus. In just a moment, we'll share together bread and wine as we remember the death of Jesus. And it is at the cross of Christ that every enemy is destroyed the enemy of our sin within. 
the schemes of the devil who, who threatens us. A hostile world who thought they could kill the Christ, but the grave could not contain him. In Christ, we are more than conquerors. In Christ, we have every blessing in the heavenly realms, every spiritual blessing. And in Christ, we have the certain blessing of the new creation. Our broken world healed and put right. A place where we can live and enjoy God forever. Are we afraid? This world is a scary place. But God is not for turning. In Christ, his every promise is fulfilled. And in Christ, we are safe. Let's pray. Father, in the, in the comedy and foolishness of Balaam and his donkey, we thank you for this insight into the foolishness of opposing you and your promises. We thank you that in Christ there is real safety. Help us to believe. Thank you for all he's done for us. In his name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing again. This next song is a great uh, song of confidence and for the journey home. Confidence in our God, in our Redeemer. As the band leads us, let's stand to sing together. Stand, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the great safety we have as we follow you home to the new creation. And I pray that you'd help us to be a people who trust your promises in Christ, who stand firm even in a hostile world, 
knowing how the journey ends in safety with you forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please do take your seats. We come now to that part of the service when those who are watching at home on the live stream will we'll say goodbye to you. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget, the virtual coffee time is on at half ten this morning. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Just a brief pause for us here now as we say goodbye.